If you have been following modern web design trends, you have probably seen those sleek websites with infinite trackable image galleries, the ones that keep expanding as you drag in any direction. We have covered a few draggable experiences on this channel before, but this time we are going infinite and adding interactivity too. We are going to build something like this. When you click on an image, it smoothly scales to the center and reveals some text. Click again and everything animates back. I think this is a super useful element, especially for showcasing portfolios, photography or projects creatively. So I decided to recreate it from scratch using JavaScript and GSAP. The version I built is a bit simpler but fully functional. I could go wild with extras like parallax or advanced animations but that would easily turn into a full hour long deep dive. So in this video, we'll focus on getting the core experience right. A smooth infinite trackable gallery with clickable images that scale to the center of the screen, revealing a clean animated title overlay. Clicking again reverses the animation, the text animates out and the image returns to its original spot. We'll build everything mostly with vanilla JavaScript and use a bit of GSAP to handle the transitions. If you'd like to see more content like this, make sure to hit that like button and subscribe to the channel. To access the source code, check out the Pro Membership via the link in the description. Pro members also get a Next.js version of this project in case you want to explore that as well. Alright, let's jump into the code. Let's start by setting up the basic HTML structure. First up, we are adding a simple navigation bar. It's split into two sections, a logo on the left and a set of links on the right. Just to balance out the layout visually and give the design a bit more structure. Next, we are dropping in a footer at the bottom of the page. Again, nothing critical here, just some placeholder content to round out the layout and make things feel a little more polished. Now onto the main section, the container where all the interactivity will happen. Inside it, we have got two key layers, a canvas element where we'll render all the trackable image logic and an overlay element which we'll use to display the full screen view when the image is clicked. Lastly, we have got a separate element for the project title. This is where the title text will appear when an image is brought to the center. That's all we need for the HTML. Let's move on to the styling next. We'll start by importing the interfont from Google Fonts. Next, we reset the base styles using a universal selector. We remove all the default margin and padding, set box sizing to border box and disable the text selection for a more interactive feel. For the body, we apply the interfont, set a soft neutral background color and hide the overflow to keep everything neatly contained on the screen. Then we style anchor tags and paragraphs, they are block level, text is white, slightly spaced and we apply a consistent font size and weight. We also smooth out the font rendering. Now let's look at the nav and footer. Both are absolutely positioned to the top and bottom of the screen, stretched full width and padded for breathing room. They are laid out with flexbox, evenly spaced using a gap and we use mix blend mode to create that subtle visual blending effect against the background. A high index makes sure they stay on top of everything else. Inside the nav, the links and social icons are grouped using flexbox as well. This keeps them neatly aligned and spaced out evenly. Moving on to the main container, its positioned relative takes up the full viewport, hides overflow and use a grab cursor to signal interactivity. Inside that, we have the canvas, absolutely positioned with will change transform to optimize performance during movement and scaling. Then we define the trackable items, each one is absolutely placed, fixed size with overflow hidden and a dark background just in case the image doesn't load. When an item is expanded, we apply a different style using a special class. This brings it to the center of the screen with a fixed position and bumps the z-index. Images inside items are styled to fully cover their containers using object fit cover. We also disable pointer events on the images themselves, so clicks always land on the item wrapper. Next is the overlay, it's fixed to cover the entire screen and uses same background color as the page. Initially it's fully transparent and doesn't accept pointer events, but when activated with a class toggle, it fades in smoothly and becomes interactive. Finally, we style the project title. It's absolutely centered on the screen and uses pointer events none, so it doesn't interfere with the interactions.
Inside it, the paragraph is styled to hold the animated text. Each word is an inline block span set to a large font size and slightly spaced out. We'll animate these spans individually during transitions, which will give us a really clean entrance and exit effect for the title text. That wraps up the CSS. Now that we have got the visuals locked in, we are ready to move on to the JavaScript part and start building out the interactivity. Before we get into JavaScript, let me quickly show you how we will set up the content that will populate our canvas. I have created a file called items.js which has this simple array called items. It holds a collection of names, each one representing an image in the grid. This is just to keep the data separate from the logic. First, we are importing a few tools. We bring in GSAP along with custom ease which lets us create smooth custom easing. Then, we pull in split type which will help us animate individual words in our project titles. And finally, we import the items list we created earlier. Next, we register our custom easing cow with GSAP. This one is called hop and it gives elements a soft natural easing. We then grab references to the key DOM elements the container that wraps everything, the canvas where items will be rendered, the overlay that dims the background during focus, and the paragraph that displays the title. After that, we set up a few layout constants. Item count sets how many different images will cycle through, item gap, columns, item width, and item height define the size and spacing of each grid element. Then comes the interaction states, is dragging, start x and target x, help us track mouse movement and handle smooth panning. We also prep variables for momentum, visibility tracking and expanded item logic. All of this is just setting the stage, giving us the tools we need to build a dynamic, animated and reactive interface. Let's move into the functionality next. Now we are diving into the functions that animate the title, the text that introduces each expanded item. First, we have got the set and animate title function. This function takes a title and splits it into individual words using split type. Each word is animated separately, creating a dynamic effect as the title appears. The words are initially set off screen with Y100%, so they are hidden at first. Then we have the animate title in function. This animates each word into view from the bottom with a slight stagger between them for extra impact. GSAP handles the timing and easing to make the words come in smoothly and in sequence. When it's time to transition to a new title, we use the animate title out function. These functions allow the project title to animate in and out as users interact with the items. The update visible items function is responsible for managing the items that are visible on the screen. Let's break it down step by step. First, we calculate the view width and view height of the viewport, adding a buffer around the edges to load items slightly outside the visible area. This helps ensure a smooth user experience when scrolling, as items just off-screen will be already prepared for rendering. We then determine whether the user is moving right or down by comparing the current position with the target position. This is important because we need to adjust how we calculate the visible items based on the direction of movement. For example, if the user is moving right, we adjust our calculations to load more items in that direction and similarly for moving down. Next, we calculate which rows and columns need to be displayed. We do this by determining the range of rows and columns that are currently in view based on the user's position and the size of the viewport. We use the item width and item height to figure out where each item should be placed. Now, for each row and column in the visible range, we create the necessary items. We generate a unique ID for each item using its row and column coordinates and position it correctly on the screen using left and top CSS properties. Each item also gets an image assigned based on its position in the grid.
When a new item is created, we add an event listener for the click event. This ensures that if the user clicks on item, it triggers the handle item click function, but only if the user isn't dragging or moving the mouse at the time, preventing accidental clicks while dragging. After rendering the new items, we check for any items that are no longer visible. If an item is outside the current visible area, we remove it from the screen to save resources and improve performance. We also make sure to keep track of items that are still active or expanded so they aren't removed during this process. The handle item click function is called when an item is clicked. It checks if an item is already expanded. If so, it triggers the close expanded item function to close it. If no item is expanded, it proceeds to expand the clicked item by calling the expand item function. Next, the expand item function is responsible for expanding the clicked item and displaying it in full size. First, we set this expanded flag to true, signaling that we have an expanded item. We also store the clicked item in active item and its ID in active item ID. We disable dragging by setting can drag flag to false and change the cursor style to auto to indicate that the user can no longer drag while an item is expanded. Next, we get the image source of the clicked item, extract the item number from the image file name using a regular expression and use this number to select the corresponding title from the item array. We then set and animate the title using the set and animate title function. We hide the original item by setting its visibility to hidden so it doesn't overlap the expanded version. We also capture the wrecked position and size of the item which will help us animate its movement when expanding. The original position object stores the ID, wrecked and image source of the item so we can return it to its original state later. We add an overlay to the page by adding the active class to the overlay element. This creates a background effect when expanding the item. We now create the expanded version of the item by creating a new div with the class expanded item. This div is given the same width and height as the original item and an image is added to it. We also add an event listener to the expanded item so that when it's clicked, it will trigger the close expanded item function to collapse it back. We append the expanded item to the document body, making it appear on the top of the current items. Now we animate the other items by fading them out using gsaps2 function. This creates a smooth transition and keeps the focus on the expanded item. We also calculate the target width and height for the expanded item based on the viewport size. We set the target width to 40% of the screen width and the height is adjusted accordingly to maintain the aspect ratio. Finally, we use gsaps from 2 function to animate the expansion of the item. We start by setting the item's initial position and size, then animate it to the target size and position in the center of the screen. This creates a smooth and visually appealing transition. Next, we'll define the close expanded item function, which handles closing the expanded item and restoring the canvas to its original state. First, we check if there is an expanded item and if original position is available. If either is missing, we exit the function early to avoid errors. Then we animate the title disappearing by calling animate title out function when the expanded item is closed. After that, the overlay that was added when the item was expanded is removed by deactivating the active class from the overlay. We proceed to animate the opacity of all non-expanded items back to full opacity except for the item that was expanded. This happens with a slight delay to create a smooth transition. Then we find the original item using the active item ID and make it visible again once the expanded item is closed. The expanded item is then animated back to its original position and size and once the animation completes, it is removed from the DOM by restoring the original item's visibility. The state variables related to the expansion are reset to prepare for the next interaction. Finally, we reset the can drag flag, change the cursor back to grab and clear the drag velocity values to prepare for the next drag action. Next, we'll define the animate function which is responsible for animating the canvas during user interaction. We start by checking if dragging is enabled with can drag flag. If it's true, we continue the animation process. To ensure smooth movement, we apply easing to the current X and current Y values so the canvas moves gradually toward the target position. The canvas is then moved based on the updated current X and current Y values.
Next, we'll define the event listeners for handling user interactions with the container, allowing for drag and drop functionality and touch support. First, we handle the mouse down event on the container. If dragging is enabled, we set is dragging to true, mark that the mouse hasn't moved yet, and record the starting position of the mouse. We also change the cursor to grabbing to indicate that dragging is in progress. Next, we handle the mouse move event on the window. If dragging is active, we calculate the change in position dx and dy based on the mouse's current position. If the mouse has moved more than a threshold, we set mouse has moved to true. We then calculate the time difference between the current and previous mouse movements, adjusting for potential delays to keep the drag smooth. Based on this, we calculate the drag velocity to apply momentum when dragging. The target X and target Y values are updated based on the mouse movement and the starting mouse position is updated for the next frame. After the mouse is released, we handle the mouse up event. If dragging was active, we disable it by setting is dragging to false. If there was any significant movement, we apply momentum by adjusting the target X and target Y based on the drag velocity. The cursor is then reset to grab. We also add event listener for the overlay element. If an overlay is clicked and the item is expanded, we close the expanded item by calling close expanded item function again. Lastly, we handle touch start events on the container. This is for touch devices where we check if tracking is enabled and then record the initial touch positions. We start with the touch move event. If dragging is active and enabled, we calculate the change in position using the touch current coordinates. If the touch has moved significantly, we mark mouse has moved as true. We then update target X and target Y based on the touch movement. The touch position is recorded to keep track of the movement for the next frame. Next, we handle the touch end event. When the touch ends, we disable dragging by setting is dragging to false. We then define the resize event listener. If the window is resized and item is expanded, we calculate the new size for the expanded item. The width is set to 40% of the viewport width and the height is adjusted again accordingly to maintain the aspect ratio. The GSAP library is used to animate and resizing of the expanded item. If no item is expanded, we call the update visible items function to ensure the items are correctly updated for the new viewport size. Finally, we call update visible items function to ensure that the visible items are initialized based on the current state and then we start the animate function to begin the animation loop. This ensures that drag, touch and resize interactions are smoothly handled in the application. So that was it. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.